And here we yeah. go. So it's 12 noon. I'm going to start the recording. Um, and Lucy's going to take over. The only thing I want to mention is that if you're a member of Glasser Institute for Choice Theory, that you can apply for a free CEU today. If you aren't a member, you can become one if you'd like, um, but the CE would cost $10 um, for today if you're a non-member. So if you need that, I'll put the information in the chat, um, but we are now able to offer CEs for these one hour sessions. So Lucy, it is all yours, girl. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the country. And, then, and uh, this, my name is Lucy Billings Robbins. And I'm happy to uh, welcome you to the Reality Therapy Corner. We meet here the last Thursday of each month to discuss reality therapy. And uh, so far, we've had some interesting sessions. And I know we have one planned, a good one planned for today, because our special guest today is Wendell Walker. And Wendell Walker was my first introduction to the Glasser Institute training and my first introduction to Dr. Glasser himself. Uh, Wendell and Glasser and I all went to a movie together before I was even in the Institute training program. So that was fun. Plus I have lots and lots of other mem good memories of Wendell and he's always fun and always educational and entertaining. So I'm, Wendell is going to take care of us this morning, and I'm going to turn the next part of the program over to him. All right. Lucy, you said there would be a round of applause? Yes. People, people. Have, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wonder who was the person who first figured out a round of applause. They, they, their name ought to be somewhere, you know, uh, to get recognition. I always like to give recognition to people. Um, let me uh, uh, either uh, Lucy or Vicky um, or myself or people jump in. I want to move fast, give a lot of people a chance to share a technique yeah. idea. Um, and I don't know if you want to raise your hand and then somebody say, go to Tom, go Laura, go Russell, whatever it is. Uh, but I'd like to, I'm going to start off with my, my own. And uh, then I invite you to jump right in. And uh, I'm going to try, although we've got it recorded, and you might too. Uh, I've asked people to make a sign of maybe a cutesy little uh, name to the technique or the idea that they find helpful. And I'm going to try to write all these down. I've got mine kind of labeled too. So I do mostly teaching. My wife has been a practitioner. And uh, so a lot of my techniques and little things I remember to try to uh, help other people learn how to effectively implement reality therapy choice theory um, is, is from a teaching point of view. And so um, I want to just start off, I hope he might join us later, but Dr. Bob Wobbling, uh, who, uh, I don't know how many of you, maybe show of hands, how many of you know the term GOAT? It's used in the sports field and the sports world. Uh, Maureen, what does it stand for? Uh, it's too, usually the- Greatest the, of all the, times. Too yeah, late. greatest. Too yeah. late, Maureen. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. 15 points for Tom. <laughs> yeah, greatest of all time. And they'll say Michael Jordan was the goat of basketball, Roger Federer, you know, it's mostly in sports. Anyway, I think that the goat of reality therapy techniques and little tips and so forth for remembering how uh, to enhance counseling and teaching would be WDEP. Uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't encompass everything that's part of counseling with choice theory, but it captures the core of it. And I, I believed at one time, if you had a person who was a high school graduate, a decent human being, in, intelligent, who was kind and uh, considerate and empathy, and you taught them reality therapy, even back at that time when we had no choice theory psychology uh, behind it, I think they could be better than a great number of people who are practicing and getting paid because just they would just a simple 
straightforward process. So WDEP really does it for me, you know, and we know that's what do you want? What are you doing? What's your evaluation of your behavior and what's your plan? Yeah. And the you and the your uh, puts the responsibility. Uh, choice theory is a psychology of personal responsibility. So I give WDEP the lead off uh, uh, goat for uh, techniques. I've got one I call motorcycle and sidecar. And some of them are kind of silly and fun and some of them may or may not communicate to other people. So I have to figure out. But so I say, listen, there's a motorcycle and sidecar here. And there's a person sitting in the sidecar and this other person runs out, jumps on the motorcycle, cranks it up and takes off. And the sidecar is still there. The sidecar is still there because they're not they're connected. connected. They weren't connected. Duh. <laughs> I mean, it's so simple and yet so infinitely <laughs> important to the relationship. So we talk about relationships and connectedness, the connecting habits, the disconnecting habits, that sort of thing. So it's a fun little thing that would make sense. And so I say, hey, I just graduated from uh a master's program in counseling, put me in coach, I'm ready to go. And I'm here, I'm counseling away. I've got techniques and I'm, I'm hard hitting and what have you. And, uh, and we're going nowhere because I'm not connected with the client, you know, too. So there are all these things that, uh, that we know how to do, active listening, empathy, that sort of thing. So motorcycle, sidecar. Uh, there's another one I got, a lot, I try to attribute these to people when I remember. I probably got this from one of our former colleagues, Perry Good. Uh, the person's talking about in counseling, everything is going, nothing is going right. Work, family, uh, finances, kids, neighbor, what, neighbors, whatever. And it's just all jumbled up. And the analogy of the, is like, well, it, the person says, all right, hold on up. Let me see if I got a handle on this. Well, there's a lot going on and no wonder you're, you're frustrated and kind of stuck because there's so much and it's hard to tell what's happening and to separate it. Let's do this. And, and you draw kind of this ball of yarn that's all kind of jumbled up here and there. And how are we going to pull those people? And you see, there may be 50 pieces in there. How are we going to, how are we going to separate them? But you find an end and you pull that end out on the kind of the drawing. You pull it out down here. And then you label it work. And let's find another one here. There's another one, but pull that one out over here and we'll label it uh, marriage, you know? And in a little while, so it, it, do I have it right? Do these seem to be the most important four or five uh, issues right now? Yeah, even though there are more, would it be helpful to you for us to focus on these and not the other kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's almost like getting some sort of a, slowing the person down, their, their mind is racing here, slowing it down and getting them just to focus on something specific. So, you know, if that works, okay, good. Another one that I do, get ready because you're almost ready to jump in there. Another one that I do that's fun, I, I say, all right, everybody drove here today to this training thing. Um, how many of you encountered uh, signal light, stop signs, uh, speed limits? Yeah, everybody. They're, they're posted there too. Uh, here's your question. Uh, do these speed limit signs, do the red lights, do the stop lights, do they control your driving? And people stop to think. This is a trick question, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> it's really not, but it is. You know? and, and But people would say, he made me do this. And that's the rule. That's the law. Uh, people operate. I drive over the speed limit every day. Anybody else drive over the speed limit besides me? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is being recorded, isn't it? All right, take your hands down. We don't want to. <laughs> and, and of course, the, the, the common knowledge is like on the interstate, interstate, you can drive four miles over the speed limit and not worry even if you pass a car. Anyway, quickly people see that these don't, don't control them, they have a choice. If you have an emergency, you got your flashers on and you're driving as fast as you can, but safely too. They don't control us. They're important information. And they work on a global societal kind of a way if we pretty much uh, uh, 
adhere to and, and cooperate on that time, but it's good. Um, I'm uh, jumping around. Uh, I, because I do a lot of training, um, there are models of training, and I wish I knew who originated this one, because it's just premier. Uh, a tell, show, do model. And that would be anything in skill. And I teach tennis and play tennis. So I teach <laughs> reality therapy. And so you tell people, this is what Glasser did uh, uh, in the one day programs. I sponsored him four or five times, uh, different places. And he would come and lecture on reality therapy, choice theory. Um, so he's telling, talking about it. And then he would always do a, a, at least one role play to show how it could be done, not the way, but the way he would do it at that moment, you know. And if you're in a longer workshop and the goal is for people to leave with some sense of skills, then they get, you know, they 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 step into the into the pool. And it's kind of awkward uh, doing some role plays, but that's how you start doing that. So a, a tell show to do model is uh, uh, a nice, frame for 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 teaching people let me stop for a second and ask any of you to jump in with your examples and uh so go well wendell the one that i learned real early in counseling and have used continuously since then is if you did know oh. and so anytime somebody says to me i don't know and i see it as resistance not that they are lacking the information. Then I say, if you did know, what would it be? And the and that and if it's just resistance, they will answer every single time. And um, it works so well with kids when they say, I don't care. And I say, if you did care, what would you know? It just uh, gives the, that resistance a little, the little push it needs for them to continue to talk. The second thing I'd like to say is. Um, uh, on the Glasser Institute, Mona Duncan does a session called Making Sense of It. And for her, I did all of the techniques Dr. Glasser listed in his book, Counseling with Choice Theory. Mm. So that's a nice, another nice technique little presentation people might want to uh, take a look at along the way. So he has, I think I did about 17 or 18 out of the book and people would say well where did you find the find them I mean how did you figure them out well he says it right in the book and not only that he says this is the technique I use for this and then he listed them in the back of the uh thing so it was a real easy job for me to go to the index now what's the thing in the back the index is in the front the appendix, appendix. appendix. And the appendix there they were all listed. So it made a nice little uh, worksheet for me to use a lot because if it's a technique that he used, I know it fits with choice theory and reality therapy. Wow. That's but amazing. if you did know, it's in the back of the book. He said all the time, read the book. Well, I finally got around to doing it and there it was. Oh, my. Oh, that's marvelous. So you just added the possibility of, you know, 15, 17 to to 20 techniques in one sentence. Thanks, Lucy. Who's got one? Oh, there's, there's Tom's Tom's car. Ooh, nice. All right, oh, Maureen, go. Yeah, recently, Wendell, I had a client who, oh, I still have him. He's coming and he's talking about how anxiety comes over him. You know, it just comes over me. And I said, would you do me a favor? He said, Sure, what's that? I said, would you repeat after me? When I am anxiety, this is what's going on. So he did that. And I said, but I want you to finish the sentence. He did that. And then he looked at me and he said, you mean to say I could control this? Wow. Wow. That's marvelous. And look, I mean, just, if I may. But I had the relationship first, right? Well, they, exactly. That's, that's there. Um, and, 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 and look at uh, Maureen's extremely effective use of the word anxiety. You know, people first started, uh, some started fighting Glasser, MG, 
uh, uh, started finding Glasser when he was adding ing, depressing, you know, angering, blah 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 blah. Although we we've <laughs> we've done it with other other kind of verbs, but uh, hesitant to do that. That's outstanding. I was one of the arguers, Wendell. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, see, I wouldn't. Glasser might do this quickly in the first session with a person. Oh, uh, what brings you? Down? I'm depressed. I I wouldn't say in the first couple of minutes. How long have you been choosing to depress? Even though there's some element of accuracy to that. Okay. After a Going along, I might say, well, so, so you, one of the things you're saying is that your friends call you to go to go out with them on Friday night or what have you, but you haven't been going. And so so you've been you've been choosing to stay at home. That's another thing I do. Start using the CT language. You're choosing your anger. But I, I start feeding it in. And um, so you when they call you, you've, you've chosen not to go out. And just sliding the words in there, you know, to CT language. That's a good one, Maureen. Who else has got? I'm giving Maureen credit for two there. Would you repeat after me? What a great technique. Yeah. And then modeling the language. Oh yeah. yeah. And yeah. and the same with the depressing. You know, when you're I I just let it slide in in conversation. So when you're depressing, tell me about that. What's going on? Wow. You know, it's almost like they don't don't hear you. Well, it's they not, don't until two or three sessions later, and then they not objections. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna label this is using the language and teaching, teach choice theory, start teaching it. Well, you know, I believe I've been studying some stuff, and I believe people have got these basic needs and this and that and so on. You start teaching it, it's an it's an accelerant. It's like adding a can of boost to your gas tank, or you know some kind of a uh, energy drink. It's an accelerant teaching the language and the concepts to the therapeutic process. Now, you know, if your whole livelihood is based on long-term income from a, a few clients, you're going to be out of luck. <laughs> you know, the turnover is going to be great. See, I'm, I'm counseling myself out of business. Well, the word will get around and more people will come. All right. Um, teach C to your clients. I'm circling that one. Thank you. For I'll that. tell you what Dr. Glasser said to me when you go to work at McDonald's. Say that again. You're not getting enough clients to work at McDonald's. One time I said to him, the problem with what you're teaching us in reality therapy is it doesn't take very long for the clients to catch on and then they, they look after themselves. And he said, well, <laughs> they're not sticking around, go to work at McDonald's. That was his answer. <laughs> oh my goodness all right who's got one i think i have something oh right, good okay i um i have a 40 something year old male client who has a lot of anger and a lot of entitlement and he's belligerent mode he's he's just difficult um at the in the workplace and in his home and um so we're working through that. And the other day he was telling me about his job and he said how, how overwhelmed and overworked he is. And then he was, he said, but you know what I tell myself? I tell myself that they can't make me stay past five o'clock. <laughs> and right there, I realized he has, he, he so much is so angry because he thinks he is being controlled by so many people and the world is controlling him. And he was, de he was defiant. They can't make me stay. And so he said, that makes him feel better. And then I said, well, hold up. I said, what if you change that to, I don't have to stay past five if I don't want to something to that effect. I, instead of they can't make me stay. Yeah. yeah. I'm like actually you don't, it's your choice to, you can say to yourself, I don't have to stay past five. I don't have to stay past five. And, and, and I, and he really, he pondered that. And I, I haven't seen him yet this week, but I think that made an impact on him to realize that he was viewing the world from such an external control position that when he realized that I can leave at five, 
in that, or I can stay and willingly do a little bit, 30 more minutes for my, my boss or whatever. But he became, he softened up immediately. He softened up with that. So that I, I think was a breakthrough with him last week. Nice. We, it looks like we got 20 people here watching today. Who else has got something? I got something. When Go. oh. Ron Excuse Cole. my voice. <clears throat> Go Hi, Ron. All right. You want, hi. Good to see you all. Well, I, I, I do a different kind of work, and that is I, I work with hopeless uh, patients. Um, I often do terminal illness or end-of-life situations. And so you wonder, how do you bring hope into that situation? Well, the way I have done it is I simply uh, help them to reframe dying into what can I anticipate when I reach heaven? Now, of course, first of all, I'm, I'm usually working with Christian patients, so I'm working out of the context of the Christian faith. And uh, if I were working with a Buddhist or with a Muslim patient, I would ask them to define their concept of faith at this time in life. And then we'd work from that concept. But in the Christian concept, I found something that is extremely helpful. This little book right here, it's called 50 Days of Heaven, mm -hmm. and it's by Randy Alcorn. And uh, he is probably the world's greatest authority on what the Bible teaches about heaven. He wrote a book about this thick, uh, 500 pages or more, uh, uh, which is called Heaven. And uh, the book of 50 Days of Heaven was to do, bring all that information down into 50 Days of Devotions. And, and so... When I introduce that, I say, what do, you, what do you believe about heaven, about the next step after God calls you home? And, uh, and then they start telling me, and, and it may be way out in left field, uh, but the 50 days of heaven will bring you into a context of what the scriptures say about that. Uh, and so my uh, technique would be called reframing dying into living, dying into eternity. And uh, then we use the information from the book. But I usually question them as to what their belief is and how they would pursue it. And then I would introduce some ideas from the book and say, uh, what do you think about this? Do you think this could be true? And, and then to couch it into their, their lifetime of faith and the the uh, various, the context of what they're working from. So uh, that has been a very good way for me. Now, often I'll end, end up having to work with the family because the patient dies. And then I ask them, what do you think about happened to Judy or John or Jack uh, in, in their passing on after they spent a lifetime of faith? in the Christian faith. And then they bring up their ideas and uh, then we reframe that as well. So uh, that, that would be uh, an example of how a pastor would use this. Yeah. Well, I like that uh, rather than, than the loss. Yeah. And, 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 and the grief, grieving can go on. You're saying uh, because of your, your faith and your beliefs, yeah. What can we expect there? And then and it's got, got to be very positive for a lot of people. Yeah. Too. Now, one of the things that a couple of you made me think of, too, is we recommend books to clients. We recommend books to colleagues. We, uh, and in training, uh, quite often we give out handouts. And that's another way. Just I hand out a book or a reference to uh, maybe a website. Uh, Marvin Marshall out of California uh, has a blog and a number of people probably have blogs and we've got, you know, uh, we, we've we got the different Zoom kind of, I'll call them uh, blogs or programs here that we can refer to people. And it's a quick way for people to, to learn something more. Um, 
I have, I don't, uh, I'm not very savvy biblically and uh, could not do, uh, I was talking about with, with Jim Soder on this, could, I could not do a very helpful thing with people who are looking for biblical references for guidance in their, uh, in, in their situation, you know. Um, but I, I pick up enough stuff and Glasser talked about uh, faith and religion and those things being in some people's quality world and not others. So I can go with that. But I did get a story one time. Um, and back in the old days, the preacher's riding along in the buggy, uh, one, one horse buggy, sees the farmer uh, with a hand plow and a, probably a, a mule or whatever, pulling it along. So the preacher gets out and walks over and looks around and uh, says, well, farmer, how are you doing? I'm getting a good preacher. Yeah, yeah. Well, how long have you been? I've been here three years. I bought this three years ago. Well, God <laughs> sure has been good to the land. And the farmer, not wanting to do anything negative with the preacher, thought for a second. He says, well, I guess he has, but you should have seen it when he was working it by himself. <laughs> the piece of land. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess the idea is for people certainly to give credit to uh, a higher power or a God, uh, beliefs, religion, what have you, but at the same time uh, to give themselves appropriate credit uh, because they're, they've been created with will, you know, will to, to live too. So I'll, I'll, that, that's kind of a helpful thing for me. Who else has got one? I'll do, I'll, go ahead, Megan. Sorry. Go ahead, Megan. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Megan Williams. I'm a behavior specialist for Albemarle County, and I support um, our behavior-based units in classrooms with, uh, well, our special needs students with, um, and with the choice theory mindset and lead management. Um, and so kind of hopping on some of the um, other ones, as I call it, flip it. And this is primarily with kids who are on that cusp or approaching a limit of like safety in which we're going to have to make other, like we're going to have to demonstrate another level of care. Like they're about to elope, they're about to hit, but they're sitting there and they're like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. And they're just spicy answers left and right. And so what I like to do is I say, okay, so you don't want to do that. So if it's, I'm not sitting down, I'm not sitting down. It's, are you willing to stand? Right? Like it's just the flipping it. And it's, um, if they continue to demonstrate that power need, because they're just so tired of being externally controlled in their classrooms and they're just like having these big bundles of emotion. Sometimes they just need to see it and hear it. That, like, yes, you can. Now what, like, what would you like next? Um, and it just helps them kind of see it. And with the older spicier kids, sometimes we use like a T chart. And so like on the one side, it's like what you're not doing. I'm not doing homework. I'm not sitting in that lady's math class. Like I'm not taking these notes. Great. So you're not taking the notes. Would you be able to read the notes? Right? Like, would you, um, okay, so you don't want to talk to your math teacher. Could you email them? Right? Like, you don't have to talk to them. No one's saying that you got to interact with them if you don't want to talk to them. And I don't need you interacting with them if you're about to cuss them out. Like, <laughs> let's slow it down here and like, let's, you know, we can make that plan. But sometimes just like, I find that if they're really demonstrating that need to like say what they're not going to do, like let them, let them, let them. And then we can problem solve and find a way to like flip it. Um, so that's. That's genius, Megan. Megan, did you ever uh, have a chance to meet Dr. Glasser? I did not, no. Okay. Well, uh, he might have stolen this from you, or maybe. <laughs> no. uh, he did a role play one time. And so the, the, he says, okay, let, let make a, we're going to make a plan, you know. Okay. And uh, what I'd like to ask you to do, I'll sign it. And I'm asking you to sign it because I'm not signing. So this is it's straight from Megan. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Megan Glasser says, will you sign this piece of paper saying you're unwilling to sign it? <laughs> I don't remember now, but maybe the kid signed that one, you know. With it. Are you willing to are you willing to stand? Is that okay? You yeah. can stand it in the classroom. Oh, that's that's genius, Megan. It's Thank just you. For me, it's so important for them to realize, like, whether what you decide and what you choose, you have every right to do so, like, especially in these school systems. So it's like, great, do it. But you need to be able to sit in a meeting or a conversation about the IEP meeting and, and say what you need to say, too, like, if that's what you want. Like, don't just keep yelling at me just because I'm the one in charge chasing you after around the school. Like, you know, I'm doing my part. What are you doing? So, again, <laughs> sorry, I'm spicy middle school. I apologize. I don't got those professional <laughs> words. <laughs> 
Marvin Megan. Who else has got something? I've got okay. one that I use a lot, and it's called third person. Mm -hmm. And when someone brings another person to the counseling session with them figuratively, you know, they come in saying, my husband this, my husband that, then I use the third person technique. And it's simple. You say, um, let's say my husband, I say, what's your husband's name? His name is Joe. If Joe were here, what would he tell me about you? Yeah. And then when they answer, I ask them to evaluate if Joe is correct or not. So not only are we getting the quality world pictures of the person through the person they brought with them, right? Sort of, um, instead of saying, what's your quality world picture? I say, what does your husband say about you? And we get a picture. And then I'm setting the tone that we're going to use a lot of self-evaluation in this training, in this uh, counseling session. So he says, well, Joe would say I'm a pretty good mother. And I'd say, would you would agree with him? Would you say you're a pretty good mother or a better mother? Or... And so we start that of self-evaluation almost at the beginning of a session. And, and, it, and it's a technique that's just worked <clears throat> over and over again for me. When it doesn't work is when I set it up. Like I say, uh, they never haven't, somebody comes in and they haven't mentioned anybody else. And I say, well, are you married? Yes, my husband, Joe. What would Joe say? Well, that doesn't work. It's like they have to kind of bring them to the session. They have to sort of be on their mind for it to be an, a successful technique. But um, it works over and over and over again. And the one that worked the quickest for me was a woman came to see me. I said, what brings you in to see me today? She said, my husband told me, was in your class. He told me you ought to, I ought to come see you. And I said, uh, that's Jeff. And I, he, she said, yeah. I said, if Jeff were here, what would he tell me about you? And she said, Jeff would say he's afraid I'm having an affair. And I said, are you? And she said, yes. Three minutes into a session, we're to the heart of the session. So it's yeah. a very strong, useful technique for people to develop. I have a nice work uh, sheet, worksheet on it. If you want a little more information about it, email me and I'll send it to you. Oh, thank you. Looks like we've got 26 to 25 to 30 people. And everybody's welcome. Siva, you're welcome. Marita. Everybody. So, so far, I've got 14 techniques. What is, what's your number, Wendell? Uh, I, I don't have a number. You've been about oh. a bunch. Okay, okay I'm ready for number 15. He's bringing us 15. Siva has got her hand up. Okay. Go, Thank Siva. You. Um, well, I know where you I am. I'm in San Mateo, California. <laughs> you ah, see me? me there there all right so um i i am not a therapist uh, but i do study this stuff and um what i think is lacking from glasser's work is paying attention to uh childhood traumas and particularly in the case of the man who, who has a lot of anger. And uh, I, I mostly study the work of Marsha Rosenberg, nonviolent communication. And the first step, I mean, yeah, the first step is connection, but trying to figure out why somebody feels that way is probably how they were treated as, as a, in the early, very, very early years of their life. And they have all kind of um, information in their unconscious that is driving them to their current behavior and they don't even know it's in there. So uh, rather than focusing 
on the present and how to uh, solve the, the immediate problems, more reflection to what, what's lurking behind the habitual feelings and behaviors is to connect the, the client or your friend or just this other human being with uh, whatever their story is and have them mourn. Mourning is a big part and forgiving. Mourning and forgiving are a big part of nonviolent communication. So I don't know how many techniques that is, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the uh, Siva, the, uh, a lot of you may know the Adlerians talk about early recollections. And uh, so what's the earliest you can remember back and that sort of thing. And, and they even have that part of that is that, well, I don't know exactly. Well, this is kind of like a Lucy thing. Well, just kind of make it up what you think probably occurred. Well, who was sitting around the table and who was at the head of the table and who could do this and who could do that. And it's interesting because evidently, somehow or another, a lot of fairly accurate information about those early childhood relationships would come out without specific uh -huh. examples, you know. And uh, I like what you're saying there too. Um, this is the silliest thing. I can't remember where I got it, if I got it from Blasser or something or another. And, and you know, when he uh, left uh, Cleveland to go out to Los Angeles for his psychiatric residency, he was at the, at the Veterans Hospital in West Los Angeles working in a locked up uh, psychiatric unit, okay? So everybody had the usual diagnoses. That was even before the DSM followed that. Um, so all, all of them had these things and so the story was a person was saying all kinds of things that were out there. And one of them was the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. Well, what do you do with this? And, uh, and, 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 and I'm, I'm going to attribute it to Glasser. He said, well, I heard that they're coming. Do you want to be here when they get here? <laughs> it stopped this person. And then uh, I don't, maybe they said, let's go into the rec room or let's go somewhere else. But it's kind of like you're doing a, 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 an interjection you know, there and just stopping the thinking somehow or another and getting them to focus elsewhere. So it was kind of a silly thing, but it was, uh, I don't know where I'll use that in the future. <laughs> the Russians are coming to. Uh, I want to give uh, credit to another one I, uh, from uh, Dr. Bob Wobbling. And it's so absolutely full Venn diagram with the choice theory. Um, he says people walk around. I don't know if it was original with him or, or from somebody else. Um, oh, somebody said the other day, maybe he got it because he was in Cincinnati. Maybe he got it from that, that TV station, uh, television show, WKRP or something like that. But he says people walk around in their head listening to WIIFL. Anybody remember that here at the floor? What does that stand for, Ron? Lucy? I don't Is remember. It? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Yeah, and that makes sense. What's in it for me in this relationship? What's in it for me to, to kind of go along here? And what, what's in it for you? What do you want? You know, get the quality world. That sort of thing too, but that's kind of a nice one. I like that, and it's fun. It's got some fun, fun things too. Wendell, this is Vicky. Good. Um, one of the ones that I occasionally use is, um, if you had a magic wand, uh, mm -hmm. what would you ask, or what would you want to have happen? And along with that, maybe I don't use the term magic wand. Maybe I say, if you could say what you want to say unfiltered where you didn't have to worry about how it came out what what would you want to say yeah. and then just sitting in silence and letting that person really think because yeah. um, sometimes in your uh, counseling environment 
you're the only two or three in the room. And if they could say something unfiltered, maybe it doesn't sound so bad after all. And they can figure out how to say it in a way that wouldn't hurt a person if that's what their goal is. But yeah. I like those two. Nice, very nice, yeah, thank you. I, I wrote down my paper, circled it too. Wendell, one of the ones I use, I have on my little card here, it's the ultimate question. Yes, go. If I could say or do, you fill in the blank, will it bring us closer together or push us further apart? The things that bring us closer together, of course, are the caring habits and that which pushes us further apart are the deadly habits. And you've got it right there in your hand to show people. And uh, Nancy Herrick made up business cards with those. And she may have even made uh, uh, refrigerator stickers. Yeah, yeah, that's what this is. Yeah. You can put that on the side of that MG. Would that stick to the MG? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, uh, Lucy's chariot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, the, 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 the LC. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I like, thank you for reminding us of that. How simple that is to have it in your office, a handout to people. Uh, you can make one up. Yeah, I used to do domestic violence counseling, and I'd give these to all my clients uh, and continually remind them which were they doing, the caring or the deadly habits. Uh, when they would say something happened, I said, well, what, what did you respond with? And yeah. uh, have them go back to that. Yeah. Along the lines with Tom's comments, um, I had to put on a business card. It's this size because mm -hmm. a lot of people were blaming other people for their reactions. And so I wrote, I'm 100 percent responsible for 100 percent of my words, actions and deeds 100 percent of the time. And I was writing it out on three by five cards. Um, the, finally, I got the bright idea is cheaper and kind of cool to hand them a business card. So I have that on there and people put it on their, um, when they're driving, they have it on their, their um, dash somewhere. They put it in their bathrooms on a mirror. They put it on their um, refrigerator um, and reminding themselves that they are responsible for their reactions. And I really like that one. I don't use it a lot all the time, but when I hear someone blaming, yeah. which we don't want the seven deadly habits, I'd mm -hmm. like for them to own it um, so it's just a gentle reminder. And I work with men that batter and we give these cards out um, probably every week, uh, especially if they're using blaming language. I just pull one out and hand it to them. It's hilarious. They all start laughing. I've got three. Hey, I've got four. I'm up to five. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, what I would do is I'd ask them why they were there and they'd say, well, she did this and she yeah. did that, so forth. And I, I sit there and said, well, which one of the uh, caring habits weren't you using? And they said, they'd look at them and they say, well, I know I always use all of them. And I says, oh, you were negotiating the differences? <laughs> and they said, no, oh, I guess I wasn't using that one. Yeah. Um, some of my memories for techniques, as Lucy said too, uh, from Dr. Glasser, were from videos that he made way back that a lot of us used in, in training sessions in which at one time, I don't know about now, would have been available for purchase for newer people. And there was one, there was a young woman and it would be a person like us from the training session with Dr. Glasser. And he'd ask one of us to volunteer to be a client. And always, this is interesting, uh, always not presenting an issue that was my own personal one, but maybe a client scenario that I was familiar with so that I could kind of role play it, you know. So there was a young woman and she used the name Michelle and she was totally, you know, almost totally uncooperative like this, you know. And, and after a little while, Glasser says, well, you're being what we call totally uncooperative here. But it's <laughs> interesting. It was an informational thing and not a blaming or a, uh, a shaming kind of thing, just a factual thing in his typical kind of uh, non-blaming uh, uh, voice tone, you know, too. Um, and doing stuff here and there. And 
she says, just leave me alone, leave me alone. And he says, here's the, here's the phrase, I'm not giving up on you. Yeah. You're trying to push me away and I'm not giving up on you. I'm trying to figure out how to get through to you and I haven't done so yet. Uh, I mean, we always hear kids will try to do stuff whether they to push us away because they don't trust other adults. And then they don't believe that, that you're or me, that I'm there hanging in with them, but you just keep hanging in. And then there's a breakthrough uh, a lot of the time, you know, too. So I'm not giving up on you. I'm circling that one off my list here. Who else has got one? I well, use. Go ahead. Putting, oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> I use putting thoughts on trial a lot uh, because you can do it as a role play or you can do it as a worksheet or you can just verbalize it with them. Um, so, you know, they identify the thought that, you know, maybe I'm not good enough, you know, one of those negative core beliefs or something. And then you work through the defense, which is like evidence for the thought. And then you work through the prosecution, which is evidence against the thought. And then you help them determine, you know, the judge's verdict since they're the one in control of what that verdict is. And then you can even go back and reframe the original thought from that. What kind of a label do you give in that one, Jessica? What's the evidence <laughs> or what? Um, yeah, putting thoughts on trial, I think is what it's called. Cause I, I heard about it. Um, through a CBT training before. Um, I think I, I give it a little extra than what they usually give it, but um, yeah, putting your thoughts on trial. It's excellent. Yeah. Oh, thoughts on trial, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, it's interesting. People can come up with a technique or an idea on their own and never heard of it before. I've told this story before. I'm standing next to Bill Glasser uh, in the men's room at the Galleria Hotel in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, you know, on the break. And I didn't get, it was hard to get a little bit of, of his time because he's busy and other people wanted to. And so I said, Bill, it's something I've been meaning to ask you. Um, people ask me all the time, well, did Glasser get all this stuff from Adler? Because the Adlerian and reality therapy choice theory, the Venn diagrams are phenomenally overlapping. And, uh, and so I said, uh, did you have exposure? He said, no, he had not read any Adler. He didn't meet Adler. He didn't you know, study or what have you. And people can come up with similar or identical kind of ideas on their own. And I like for the people to give themselves you know, credit on that. And um, uh, what kind of got me going down that line there? I forget not exactly, but um, okay. Um, I was thinking of another one. Uh, some of these overlap. Also, let me just uh, for myself and for others, you'll already, it'll just confirm what you know, and others maybe add to your knowledge. What we're talking about here, too, all of these things can be now, if they weren't before, something added to my organized behavior. Like I've never done this thing that Jessica was talking about, but if I put a little thought to it and I went back and heard her words, I could do this, you know, put your thoughts on trial uh, next time. Yeah, I'm a good imitator of other people's success. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, it now becomes... Uh, it's a new thing for me, but now that I know about it, it's in my organized behavior. And so now I've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of counseling or teaching techniques that are, that are in that repertoire. And, and that's one of the things we were hoping to, today to do is to add to everybody's uh, uh, organized behavior on that. Um, okay. Oh, I, I, well, I'm going to add another one here. Um, so as I'm teaching people, I say, I always have a plan. Like I don't, I haven't worked in uh, domestic violence like Siva and Tom and, and some other people there. Uh, but if I had a situation, well, I'm gonna put two of them together. Uh, I am confident that I'm gonna do no harm. You know, just like the medical profession, 
I'm going to do no harm. I think at the very worst, I'm going to do a little bit of good. Because I'm not going to be judgmental. I'm not going to be blah, this and that and so forth. And, 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 and people, they're going to get, I'm adding a third one in. If the session, the, the training session or the counseling session can end up being need satisfying to the person, a little bit of connectedness with another person in the world, a little bit of appropriate humor or laughter once in a while, feeling a little bit more empowered or important or confident uh, that they have choices, that's a success. So, uh, and I always have a plan. And my plan is just that, well, it's almost like WDEP. It's like uh, connect with people as Tom was saying, and then find out what's going in and they're going on in their world now. And we know when they come in either mandated or voluntarily, they're scales. I'm adding a fourth one in here now, the scales. So what you're saying to me is your scales are out of balance. And they might be using that when they go home and talk to people. So on one side is how things are. And then, well, how do you want them to be? You know, the last one, we got the scales right on the uh, choice theory chart. Um, so, um, the scales, um, always have a game plan. I have confidence, even if I don't know a lot about the particular area of counseling or psychology, I have a plan and I'm not, uh, I'm gonna add another one in. It's not my responsibility for their behavior, for their problem to be solved. I'm responsible to them to try to help them figure out where things are now, where they wanna be, and what might be best for them, but not for me to tell them. So my wife worked at a inpatient drug and alcohol program, and there were external control psychology people in charge part of the time. So 28 day program, person is sober, everybody's applauding, they got, they're going to a job on, on Monday, they got a halfway house, and the word comes in that they got drunk over the weekend. So the external control psychology boss says, hey, Juanita, wasn't that, uh, wasn't, wasn't Jerry your client? Yes. Well, he got drunk over the weekend. And so, well, by, by that, so, you know, you want to say, shut the heck up. <laughs> Get out of my face. Wait, Jerry was functioning. He was sober. He was healthy. He was doing that. That's what we could do. That's what we have control over, you know. And, uh, but it, the, that's all we have, it, I have control over. I don't have control over solving their problem. That's not my, my business. Do no harm. Yep. What else you got? Who's got something? Scales. Wendell. Yo. When we talk about um, external control, I find power within useful lately because I bring up the needs, the five needs, and people, especially if they have anger, concerns, issues, power is confusing. So they have to phrase it as power within. Mm. You bring in the quality world and you bring in how effective are you at meeting your quality world. Um, you bring in the belonging and the disconnecting and connecting behaviors and suddenly you might have power over how you connect with it. Yeah. That's a good one, Carol. The Thanks. power power over is like a problem for people. So I would call it power with it. Power with, yeah. Then that's what Glass was talking about. Power uh, not over people, but power with or power within yourself too. I like that. Internal control. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, um, I attempted a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, fee, a feeble attempt <laughs> at a dissertation project when I was at the Georgia State University PhD program in counseling, and, uh, which I didn't complete. I told people I'm an ABD, all but dissertation, you know. Well, the thing that I got a hold of was the Nowicki Strickland locus of control instrument. And it's been available for 50 years. I think they were even in the Atlanta area, maybe at, at uh, uh, 
that, um, oh, I forget the school. Um, anyway, and it's a 50 question thing and you answer, do this, this, do you have to help control over there? Blah, 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 blah. And then you score it. And then if you get at one end, it's like everything else in the world has control over you. And at the other end, it would be uh, 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 her 100% um, responsible business card, Vicki. You know, you feel like you're more and more in control. And so my notion was administer the test of these kids in, in, in uh, alternative school setting, and their scores would be low. And then we would do training for 10 weeks. They'd learn choice theory. Then we would administer the test again, pre and post, you know. <laughs> the problem with doing that, <laughs> they didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, yeah. Sure. Back, back to the yeah. drawing board, you know. But um, very, very oh, useful. Uh, yeah. My was, Glasser never used the term locus of control, external or internal. And it's absolutely synonymous with choice theory or external control. You know, I don't have control over anything, that, but he never used it. That was just it, you know, so, but uh, other people in their academic work or what have you would use that. What do we got? We got some other folks out there. I got one more that I can give. Um... So I work with a lot of court order mandated clients, uh, DCS, probation, uh, parole, um, uh, community corrections, on house arrest, and so on and so forth. So when they come here, I try to really think about um, when I'm listening to them talk, how much external control uh, language are they using versus internal? And so at some point, if I hear enough victim blaming and enough, you know, it's his fault, well, probation's on me for this, blah, 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 blah. I'll ask them, what is it that you want? And they'll say, well, I want to get off probation. Okay. What do you need to do to get there? And it seems sometimes so elementary, elementary to say this, but for some of these people, they have not stopped to say, I have power and control to be able to end this. I can. It may be two years, or maybe if I behave myself, I can request to get off early, or maybe if I pay my fees up, they'll let me off early, that they do have some choices. And I really like it when I just sit in silence and they start talking about what everything they need to do to get out of the situation they're in. And then I tell them just how smart and intelligent they are. And I'm really glad that they had this figured out. Yeah. Um, and it changes them. They look at me like, what, <clears throat> what are you talking about? Smart and intelligent. You yeah. know, so they went from slunched over to now all of a sudden someone thinks I'm smart and intelligent. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know? um, <laughs> It just changes. And I really didn't do a lot, just um, gave them some affirmations that maybe they haven't heard in a long time. Yeah. Ooh, I, I just listening to you say it, <clears throat> I feel more empowered just hearing your story. <laughs> just, uh, you know, realizing and recognizing what I got control over, you know, too. Um, Wendell, just for a note, you've got about two minutes to wrap up. All right, all right. Hey. Somebody out there has got one they're sitting on that the rest of us would find as a jewel. Give it to us. Come on, please. <laughs> Let me tell you how we do it in India, Wendell. We have a different cultural change, okay? And uh, we love to talk. So by the time it's 45 minutes, we still not come to the question. So I usually ask them, and I work in threes like, like Vicky does. Tell me the three things you would like to talk about that's most important in your life today. I like that. Oh. Okay. And then I use the magic wand also. Yeah. I have a very powerful magic wand. It only grants up to three wishes. Okay. <laughs> so let's use that wand for your first desire. Okay. And, and like some of y'all, I have WDP put behind my visiting card. And I never, never showed as my name. I turn it over and I put it over there. I said, you could read all about me later, but let's talk about this now. 
Mm. And we talk about the WDAP. Yeah. So that's some of the things uh, I do back here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one last one from me and then anybody else too. Um, again, one of the videotapes, Glasser's uh, talking with a guy who's a, he's a psychologist. He was a psychologist from North Carolina. So he presented a client who had a lot of crazy thoughts and uh, but was functioning in a job. And um, so he's telling him about these crazy thoughts. He said, Dr. Glasser says, give me an example. Let me tell you about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me an example. So the guy gives him one. Like, okay, yeah, that's good. I, then the guy wants to go on and talk more and more. And pretty quickly, Glasser does something like this, kind of what? Yeah, hold, hold on, hold on. You came in here convinced you had crazy thoughts. And in a very short, <laughs> Vicki, this might be an affirmation. In a very short time, you've done a good job. <laughs> of convincing me <laughs> that you're that you're crazy you've got crazy thoughts no yeah no, i haven't even told you half of it i don't need to hear anymore i'm convinced uh, and i might say do you want to come in every week and pay me 60 bucks an hour and just complain about crazy thoughts or would you rather start trying to i think i, I think we could help you here kind of move beyond some of that which would make more sense to you. But you've convinced me. You've convinced me that you're unhappy. You've convinced me that you've got crazy thoughts. You know. And the guy said in, in the processing of the role play afterwards, he says, I meant to be crazier. People <laughs> like to stump the stump, the, uh, the yeah. stump glasser, you know. I meant to be crazier. How'd you do it? He just said, when you said, do you think, but he asked him, he said, do you think I'm crazy? Glasser said, yeah. Right now you've got crazy thoughts. But you're you're working well, and I think if we uh, spend some time together, we can help you move beyond some of that. It's it's a calming thing. You've yeah. convinced me, Wendell. Thank you so much for today, and be sure and look at the chat, Wendell. There's lots of thank yous there from the people. You gave us uh, uh got our brain going, and we're thinking of all the different uh, types of uh, techniques and things we can add that are. I got a total number of 28. I don't know what you got in your number. So nice job. That's about one every two minutes we were getting. Yeah. Um, we're, we meet again next month, second of uh, the last Tuesday of the month and um, at 12 noon Eastern time, our guest special guest that session will be Mona Duncan. And Mona is going to be uh, leading a conversation about working with people, difficult people or people in difficult situations. So I look forward to seeing her and all of you back the next time. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'll, uh, I'll try to respond to all emails as quickly as possible. And um, thank you again. We'll close the meeting out for those that need to go. I would thanks, like to, thanks, everybody. I would like to copy some of these email addresses of people. Uh, is there a way to kind of leave that on for a few minutes? Or you just have yeah, to 